It's the summer of 1943. The Second World War is in full swing. Thousands of American and British bombers are slowly but surely flying towards the heart of the Third Reich. Their goal is to wipe out factories, cities, and infrastructure. In this brutal fight, German fighter planes desperately charge into the steel armada. Luftwaffe pilots know their job is to stop the enemy at any cost. But their weapons are too weak against the armored giants flying towards Berlin. Rifle caliber machine guns only scratch the thick armor of the flying fortresses. Even small caliber cannons need dozens of hits to shoot down just one bomber. It's in this bloody fog that a new weapon is born, the Luftwaffe's last resort, an aircraft cannon whose sound is like a jackhammer and each shell brings instant death and destruction. This is how the story of the MK-108 begins, a cannon that became the main weapon for the most powerful versions of the legendary Focke-Wulf 190 and the primary attacking force of the Luftwaffe. Let's find out who and what was behind its creation. Before the fearsome MK-108 pneumatic hammer arrived, the skies of World War II were a stage for old, proven solutions. In those years, aircraft weapons were like a chess game where each country made its move based on past conflicts. It seemed the balance of power was set forever. At the start of the war, most fighter planes from all countries were armed with rifle-caliber machine guns, from 7.62 to 7.92 millimeters. These were the same machine guns that once fought in the skies of World War I. They were installed in multiples hoping that a high rate of fire would make up for a lack of power. But time moved on, and weapon requirements grew. Heavy machine guns appeared, 12.7 and even 13 millimeters. The Americans for example bet on the Browning M2, while the British relied on a hail of fire from .303 caliber Brownings. Their philosophy was simple. Create a cloud of lead so that at least a few bullets would hit the target. Legends were told about British pilots who joked, if you don't hit the plane, you'll hit the sky. Americans, on the other hand, were proud that their B-17 flying fortress could take dozens of hits and still return home. The British installed 8, or even 12.303 caliber Browning machine guns on their Spitfires and Hurricanes. But this strategy had its downsides. To shoot down a heavy bomber, an enormous number of hits were needed. Pilots often complained that even after a long burst, the enemy kept flying as if nothing had happened. The idea was simple, create such a dense cloud of lead that at least a few bullets would find their target. The Americans held a similar view, but preferred the more powerful 12.7mm Browning M2 machine gun. At the same time, German and Soviet engineers took a different path. They focused on cannon armament, 20mm and even 30mm cannons. Their logic was simple. One shell causes much more damage than a dozen bullets. In the Luftwaffe, the 20mm MG 151-20 cannons dominated. They were reliable and balanced but still not perfect. When heavy four-engine Allied bombers appeared on the horizon, it became clear that the old weapons were no longer enough. Thus began the search for a new solution, a weapon capable of stopping a flying fortress with a single shot. This challenge became the starting point for the creation of the MK-108, which changed the rules of the game in the skies of Europe. The job of creating this new wonder weapon was given to Rheinmetall Borsig, a giant in Germany's war industry. There you could feel the tension in the air. The factory smelled of oil and metal and engineers worked all night long. The project was led by Hans Joachim von Ohain, a man with a cold stare and a strong will. He asked for the impossible and inspired his team with his passion. His name became known for bold technical ideas, and every drawing was a step into the unknown. But the real brains behind the MK-108 was Frank Werner, a young but already famous engineer. His way of working was special. He put together a team of the bravest and most creative thinkers. In Werner's lab, there was a feeling of creativity and risk. People weren't afraid to make mistakes. They looked for solutions that pushed the limits. It was thanks to his leadership and hard work that such a complex project was finished in record time, from the very start the project had the support of the top brass in the Luftwaffe. General Adolf Galland, a famous ace pilot and inspector of fighter aircraft, personally watched over the work. Galland was a man of action, he hated delays and demanded results. His visits to the factory always brought a tense silence. The engineers knew that not only their careers were at stake, but also the future of the air war. Galland understood that without this new weapon his pilots were doomed. But not everyone was happy about Rheinmetall's success. Other companies like Mauser tried hard to push their own designs such as the MG-213 cannon. There were tricky plots, slow paperwork, 
and sometimes even outright sabotage, everyone wanted a piece of the war contracts, using stamped parts instead of expensive machine ones, getting rid of complex gas systems, and adding a simple blowback system. All of this made production much cheaper and faster. In the Rhine metal workshops, there was a feeling of victory. Each new test model brought them closer to the long-awaited finish. But the team still faced new challenges and surprising turns which we'll talk about next. Developing the MK-108 was a real challenge for German engineers. Even with its eventual success, it was clear early on that creating a cannon strong enough to pierce heavy bomber armor, yet light enough for a fighter plane, seemed almost impossible. A major hurdle was sinking the firing to shoot through a spinning propeller. Any mistake could lead to disaster. The first prototypes mounted on the BF-109 showed terrible results. At best, the cannon was wildly inaccurate, and at worst it literally shot off its own propeller blades. The engineers were desperate, it seemed the project was doomed to fail. The solution came unexpectedly. A young specialist suggested using an electro-pneumatic trigger instead of a mechanical one. This allowed for the necessary precision and synchronization, but the difficulties didn't end there. The next big headache was designing the shell casing. Standard brass casings couldn't handle the stress, jamming the mechanism or bursting when fired. The answer was found in using steel lacquered casings, cheap, strong and resistant to overheating. This solution was one of the key technical breakthroughs that allowed the cannon to go into mass production. But it wasn't just technology that determined success. A real spy drama unfolded around the MK-108 project. Designers suspected that rival companies and even foreign intelligence agencies were trying to uncover the new cannon secrets. Archives hint that some ballistic and shell design solutions were borrowed from Swedish engineers, through shell companies, and recruited agents. In the end, despite all obstacles, technical, organizational, and even political, the MK-108 was perfected, and very soon, this new cannon changed the rules of air warfare. If you just look at the specs for the MK-108, they might seem pretty plain. At first glance, nothing special, 30 mm caliber, weighing a bit less than 60 kilograms. But behind these numbers is a whole way of thinking about engineering. The main thing about the MK-108 is how simple it is and how easy it was to build. The designers got rid of complex parts to make the gun as cheap and fast to produce as possible. For example, many parts were stamped, not carved out which made putting it together quicker. Now for the numbers, caliber 30 mm, cartridge 30 by 90 RB, the gun's weight, only 58 kilograms which meant it could even be put on light fighter planes, firing speed, from 600 to 650 shots per minute, the starting speed of the shell about 540 meters per second. To compare, many other guns at that time had higher speeds but the MK-108 focused on something else. Yes, the low starting speed of the shell was often criticized, its path was steep, almost like a mortar, and this made it harder to aim at long distances. But this way of flying also had a good side. The shell stayed in the target's hit zone longer when shooting up close. But the real new idea was the ammunition. The normal high-explosive Minengeskos shell had 85 grams of powerful explosive inside. To compare, the 20mm MG 151 20ths had only 18 grams, and the British Hispano had about 12. This means one MK-108 shell was almost five times more destructive than its rivals. That's why even one such shell hitting a bomber's wing or body led to terrible results, a wing breaking off, a main support beam tearing apart, the whole structure instantly falling apart. This made up for all the problems with how the bullet flew and made the MK-108 a scary weapon for close-up fights. In the end, the MK-108 became a symbol of finding a balance between being simple, powerful, and quick to make. It wasn't perfect, but it was perfect for the conditions of a total war, when every minute and every resource mattered. It's solutions like these that shape the path of technology. And now let's see how the Allies reacted to this unusual weapon and what changes it brought to the air war. The appearance of fighter planes armed with MK-108 cannons was a real shock for the Allies. Bomber crews, used to returning to base with bullet holes in their wings and damaged engines, suddenly faced a new reality. Now even one accurate shot could lead to disaster. American pilots often recalled feeling truly vulnerable for the first time in the war. One British gunner remembered, We always thought our Lancasters could take anything, but after facing these cannons, the planes literally fell apart in the air. 
Allied commanders' reports began to show alarming notes about new, previously unknown damage, huge holes in the fuselage, torn rudders and wings. Now, the situation had completely changed. Planes started falling apart in the air from just a few hits, exploding for no clear reason. Surviving crew members spoke of dull, powerful thuds, as if the fuselage was being hit with a sledgehammer. In the first few weeks, Allied command didn't immediately believe these stories. Some generals thought the crews were exaggerating the danger due to stress. But as the number of lost aircraft grew and the type of damage kept repeating, it became clear the enemy was using something new and extremely dangerous. Initially, the 8th Air Force Command didn't even believe the reports, thinking they were exaggerated fears from the crews. However, as losses mounted, it became impossible to ignore the new threat. This forced an urgent re-evaluation of strategic air combat tactics. In response, the Allies tightened their combat formations. Bombers began flying closer together to increase their crossfire, and escort fighters were ordered to stay right with their charges. Special attention was given to new fighter models, the Mustang and Thunderbolt, which now patrolled the skies literally over every formation. Additionally, the British began actively implementing electronic warfare measures to protect their bombers from German night fighters, which were equipped with radar and MK-108 cannons. They used radar countermeasures, the famous window, this simple but effective tool confused German radars and saved many lives. The MK-108 cannon first saw action in the summer of 1943. The first groups of BF-109 G6-U4 and FW-190A6-R2 fighter planes, armed with the new weapon, were sent into battle against American bombers. A real drama unfolded in the skies over Europe, for both the pilots and those they were targeting. German pilots had different opinions. Young aces, who used the MK-108 for the first time in battle, remembered how a single shot could tear an enemy bomber apart. One of them said, It was like a lightning strike, a short burst, and the huge machine turned into a fireball. On one hand, they were thrilled by the cannon's incredible power. Veterans who used to spend almost all their 20mm ammo on one bomber could now shoot it down with just a few accurate hits. One pilot recalled, Before, we shot until we were exhausted, now three shots and the target falls. But there were also those who were wary of the MK-108. Experienced pilots noted that the new cannon required different tactics and nerves of steel. One of them admitted, With this weapon, you feel all-powerful, but also vulnerable at the same time. On the other hand, many experienced pilots criticized the cannon for its terrible ballistics. The low speed of the shell and its curved path meant pilots needed completely different shooting skills. A pilot had to get very close to the target within 200 to 300 meters, which was extremely dangerous. One Luftwaffe veteran remembered, To hit, you had to get so close you could see the faces of the enemy gunners. My heart pounded, and time seemed to stand still. The legendary ace Eric Hartman, known for his close-range shooting tactics, spoke about the MK-108 with caution preferring the more accurate and longer-range MG-151-20. With this hammer, you're either a hero or dead, there's no middle ground, he said. For many German pilots the MK-108 became a symbol of a desperate fight, a weapon that offered a chance but didn't forgive mistakes. From the perspective of American bomber pilots, the arrival of the MK-108 turned every mission into a game of chance. Sergeant Robert Jenkins, a B-17 gunner, described his first encounter with the new weapon like this. We heard stories about the new German cannon, but we didn't believe it was that dangerous. The first time a shell exploded nearby I thought it was the end. There was chaos in the sky, fire, smoke, shouts over the radio. We were flying over Schweinfurt. Suddenly I saw a Messerschmitt coming head on, it wasn't shooting just coming straight at us. When it was very close orange balls like tennis balls burst from its nose. Then there was a deafening roar, and our plane shook so hard I almost flew out of my turret. After the battle, many Americans admitted, now every flight is like playing with death. We started to fear not only anti-aircraft guns but also these new cannons that could destroy a plane with one hit. So the MK-108 changed the rules of the game in the skies over Europe. It brought fear, respect, and new tactics, for both attackers and defenders. But despite its destructive power, it couldn't change the course of the war alone. New challenges, new technologies, and new sacrifices lay ahead. Even though the MK-108 gun was super powerful, it couldn't change how the air war was going. 
It showed up too late and there weren't enough of them to really make a big difference. By 1944 when they started making a lot of them, the Allies already had so much more stuff and power that no special weapon could save the Reich. In our next videos we'll talk more about the amazing planes, tanks, ships and giant guns that were used in World War II, so, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you get a notification when our new video comes out. Give this video a thumbs up, and tell us in the comments what legendary war machine you'd like us to talk about on our channel. And we'll see you soon in our next videos friends, bye for now!